He's my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for Him. Amen. I love that song. We, uh, there's a movie called Twister. I don't know if you've seen it. It's about a tornado, but one of the lines in the movie is, We've got debris. Well, this morning we've got debris at Hilltop. We just had a tree blow by. There it is. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> it was uprooted and everything. No, that's, it's a fake tree. But, <laughs> oh, I am so grateful again for each and every person here. And uh, for those who are online, we just want to thank you again. Uh, Kim Lambert's with us this morning. Wave, Kim. Yay. She's been grandma, right, for a few weeks here in El Segundo. Congratulations again, Carson, right? Just adorable. Oh, my goodness. So, Kim, good to have you with us. For all of our guests who are here this morning, we want to say welcome again. Let's take out our Bibles. If you're online, if you're here, uh, although the paper Bible might be blowing a bit this morning. So, um, but turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And we are just uh, in the thick of it right now. I, I love Philippians chapter 3, chapter 4. Uh, I hope you've just been blessed by hearing God's Word. And so we want to talk about, first of all, what are you thankful for this morning? I mean, you wake up on a Sunday morning and you think about all the things that you have to be thankful for. Some of you saw online that... Um, Yesterday was our granddaughter's first birthday, Amelia. Is, she, tur she turned one and had something that I didn't know that I had when I was a child called a smash cake. I guess that's in, is that what it's called, a smash cake? But it's their first cake, right? And they just jump into it and I guess smash into it. So it was kind of fun uh, watching her do that. Uh, some of you uh, woke up... Uh, Maybe Friday morning, Saturday morning, and are thankful for uh, what's happened in our country. And a lot of us here, I know, are, are not thankful, right? For, but, but as Christians, this is a time to shine like stars in the universe. So whether your candidate was elected or not, we are told as Christians that we are to pray for our leaders. And so I, I want to encourage us to do that. Uh, to pray and this is an opportunity for us to really represent unity in the body of Christ because Jesus Christ is above what's happening in this world right Jesus Christ is above all of this and as Paul tells us in this letter that he wrote to this young church in, in Philippi he says that we are living for an alternate kingdom. That our focus, we'll see it again in chapter 3, is heavenward. That we are to look heavenward in Christ Jesus. So, as you think about what you're thankful for, what are you thankful for in Jesus Christ? That is the focus of Philippians because Paul isn't thankful for his circumstances. He's in jail. He is chained up. He is literally on death row. He is a dead man walking. But Paul has never, ever been more thankful in his life. He has never experienced more joy in his heart. So he has a heart that is just full of thanksgiving, and it has nothing to do with the circumstances of this world. So listen, you got to focus on the future. you got to focus heavenward. In Christ Jesus, if you want to have the joy of the Lord, it does not matter what's happening in the kingdom of this world. It matters what's happening in the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's the reality we're living for. And that's why Paul says, to live is Christ. To live is Christ. Say it with me. To live is Christ. To die is... Oh, I like that. Yeah. To live is Christ. To die, even better. And why? Because of his relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you back up before verse 12, we're really gonna focus on verse 12, but if you back up before verse 12, Paul talks about 
the, the surpassing joy of knowing Christ Jesus, of being in a relationship with Christ Jesus. And he says, I want you to consider some things. First of all, he says, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus. He says, I have lost all things. I give up all things. He says, everything that I had in this life is garbage compared to knowing Jesus, to the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul says, everything is garbage. Everything. Throw it out compared to our walk with Jesus Christ. And then when you get to verse 12, I think for me, these are some of the most profound verses in all of the Bible. I really want you to focus on these this morning. In fact, that's what Paul says. Consider this. Think about these things. Here's what, here's what God wants you to think about this morning. Look at verse 12, chapter 3. Not that I have already obtained all this. Like, he doesn't know everything about Christ Jesus, right? He's not perfect in his relationship. He says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. That's what, those two words I want you to focus on today. Press on. What does it mean to press on? He says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ has already taken hold of me. And that was our focus last week, right? This morning I want to talk about pressing on. But that verse, take hold of that for which Christ has already taken hold of you. That's what that means. He's already done it. He's got his arms around you. He has taken hold of you. Now you have to live into what he has taken hold of you for. What has he taken hold of you for? He has taken hold of you for forgiveness, for salvation. In Philippians, he's taken hold of you and forgiven you so that you could experience the joy of the Lord and you could have a deep sense of peace in your life regardless of the circumstances around you. That's what he says. Do you have peace in your heart right now? Because there's a lot of people that don't have peace in their heart right now. Are you experiencing a joy that just is surpassing because of your relationship with Jesus? Or are you just depressed? Are you discouraged? I mean, you look on TV and you see people weeping for joy and you see people weeping for sorrow. And a lot of that sorrow is, is around what happened last week, but there's sorrow because there is loss. There's this pandemic and there's this division. And, and so, yes, I understand those things are real, but Paul's circumstance was real too. He says that he's got the joy of the Lord in his heart. He's experiencing this deep sense of peace that passes what? Understanding. Understanding. We'll see that in a couple weeks. So now he says, uh, verse 13, brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself you have taken hold of it. One thing I do, that's a focus statement, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on to, toward the goal to win the prize, which is called me heavenward. See, that's that upward focus. You can be focused on what's around you, but in Christ Jesus, we need to be focused on heaven. And it's not just heaven when we die or Jesus comes back. It is heaven now. So verse 15 says this. this. This is key. Look at verse 15. After he says this, he says, All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Now, that's important. Now, at first it sounds like if you disagree with me, you're, you're immature. Right? Those of you who are mature will agree with me. And if you don't agree with me, then God's going to make it clear to you. That's kind of funny when I, when I hear him say that. I'm not sure that's what he's saying, but we'll get to that in just a moment. 
So I want us to think about press on to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of you and then press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus. Press, press on to take hold of the prize, to win the prize. So first of all, what's the goal? He says, press on towards the goal. What, what is the goal for Christians? It's heaven, it's righteousness, but I also heard a lot of people, scholars, talking, and some said that the goal is perfection, and some said that the goal is progress. Is the goal perfection, or is the goal progress? It's both. I believe it's both, and here's why. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gets to a point after he talks about, you know, becoming righteous, exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees, he gets to the point where he says, listen, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Perfection is the goal. Don't miss that. He says, be perfect, not just be perfect. He says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow. And that only comes through Jesus Christ, right? I mean, nobody has arrived yet. That's what Paul says. I I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived. But I'm pressing on towards perfection. But also, the goal is progress. Are you making progress in your walk with the Lord? How about during this COVID season? Are you closer to God in the middle of COVID? Or do you feel farther from God? Now, that's a question only you can answer. But, you know, Peter says the same thing. And I'm, I'm not, you won't have it on your screen. You don't have to turn there. But just listen to what Peter says. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And he talks about progress here. He says, his divine power, that's God, godly Christ's power, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge, and that what Paul's talking about, right? I want to know Christ and the power of his rising, share in his suffering and conform. I want to know Christ. He wants that knowledge. So he says, His divine power is given everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them, you may, part listen, you may participate in the divine nature. Wow. You might... You know, we, we saw earlier that, that Jesus Christ, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to, to be grasped. Peter's saying you could participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to add your faith goodness to your goodness knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, to godliness, mutual affection, to mutual affection, love. That's his list of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Now, here's where I want us to see. Verse 8, 2 Peter says this, chapter 1. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure. Let me say it again. If you possess these qualities, he's just listed, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's progress, right? So, perfection is the goal. It happens through Jesus Christ. But God wants us to be progressing in our faith, in our knowledge, in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, turn back to, in your Bibles, uh, back to Philippians chapter 3, and let me read this again. Not that I have already obtained this, this perfection, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. There's a lot you could do right now, or maybe, maybe not, depending on 
you know, this isolation. <laughs> but he says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize. One thing. There's a lot you could be doing right now. There's a lot you could be focusing on. He says, one thing, this crystal clear focus is forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. And so here's what he's trying to tell us. If you are caught in the past, you cannot move forward in your faith in Jesus Christ. There are some things you have to forget to move forward in your walk with God. He's not saying don't learn from your past. The, the Bible tells us that clearly. But if you are stuck in the past, how could you be stuck in the past? If you are focused on your failures, or if you are focused on your successes, then it keeps you from pressing on. That's important. And so maybe you're stuck in both this morning. I don't know, but I, I want you just to think about, are you carrying guilt? because of your past sin. Jesus died to cleanse you. Jesus died to forgive you. You don't have to carry that guilt. Are, are you carrying guilt about your failures that you've had in your past? And maybe you've had a, maybe you've had a marriage fail or maybe you've had a relationship fail. Paul says you've got to forget that. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. And if you're like me, sometimes your failures are just like these tapes that play over and over and over in your head. And you lay down at night, what tapes are playing? Maybe you're one of those people you can just lay down and boom, you're asleep. Most of the time, we've got these tapes that are just spinning. Are they negative tapes? Are they tapes of failure? Or are they they tapes of the glory days right you know you you could get stuck in your success as well it's like oh i remember the glory days i remember when the church was this or i remember when the church was that or i remember you know talking about the past again forgetting what is behind because the past will paralyze you that's the reality that paul wants you to hear this morning there, you know, he uses a lot of race language here. I don't know if you're a runner. Randy, I think you were a runner, right, in track and sort of. <laughs> but that's the, that's the language that he uses here is, is that we are running a race. And he says, run in such a way as to win. The greatest, well, I think one of the greatest races ever was called the Miracle Mile. Now, I don't know if you have heard about the Miracle Mile. It happened uh, in 1954. And it was between two people. Well, really, there were eight people in the race, but only two people were able to break a four-minute mile. Only two people on the planet were able to break a four-minute mile. It was Roger Bannister. He was from England, and John Landy from Australia. And John Landy really was the one everybody expects to win. He had run a 358-mile and on Saturday, August 7th, 1954, they came head to head. There were 35,000 people that were spectators there. It was called the Empire Stadium. It was in Vancouver, British Columbia. 35,000 people and hundreds of thousands of people were listening online. Or not online, but uh, on, on, the, on the radio. <laughs> I don't know if they had TV in 54, maybe. But they were definitely gathered around the radios or watching this. And here was this track meet head to head. And as expected, within about halfway through the first lap, John Landy just takes the lead. And he is probably 12 meters ahead by the end of the first lap. Second lap even more ahead of everybody, including Bannister. But on the third lap, Bannister starts to close in on him. And by the end of the third lap, the crowds are just screaming and hollering, and you could just hear this roar. 
as these two men are ahead of everybody by now, they enter that fourth lap and coming around the final turn, Landy hears the crowd, but he, he doesn't know where Bannister is. And so what does he think he does? He looks back. He actually, this time, he looks to his left. He kind of looks down to see if he can see the feet of Bannister. And as he looks down this way, Bannister passes him on the right. And he wins the Miracle Mile, the greatest race of all time. Paul is saying, don't look back. Don't focus on your past because you can trip and you can fall. And that's exactly what Satan wants. He wants you to focus on the past. Paul's saying, no, you've got to focus on the future. If Paul, if anybody had a chance to focus on his past, it would have been him, right? Persecuting Christians, even to the point of their death, throwing them in jail. Paul knew he can't think about his past. He's got to think about his future so how will you do that can you just imagine for a moment letting the past go today can you look to what jesus christ has done for you and accept that forgiveness because i don't know about you sometimes the hardest people to forgive are ourselves or maybe you're carrying bitterness in your heart and and bitterness is like I've said before, it's like swallowing a deadly pill but expecting somebody else to die. That's bitterness. And we carry that around. And so Paul says, no, you've got to forget the past. You've got to focus on the future. Forget the failures. For, learn from them, but then let them go. And, and look on what's ahead. Have anybody heard this term before, rest on your laurels? Have you heard that? Okay. What are your laurels? They're not what I thought they are. But um, when he says, rest on your, your laurels, it's kind of your past achievements, right? Don't rest on your past achievements expecting that they're going to help your future. Press on, press on, press on towards the future because you have already been made perfect. And that's what verse 15 says in a little different way. Then he said just above. Verse 16, he says, Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Did you get that? You have been forgiven in Christ. The day that you accepted Jesus Christ, put your faith in Jesus, you received that righteousness and were baptized into Jesus Christ, you were made perfect. But then you sin and you have this process of sanctification, right? And you're never fully there until you die, except by the blood of Jesus Christ that continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when it says in verse 15, all of us then who are mature, that word is actually translated perfect. All of us who have been made perfect, right, should take a view of such things. I think that's important. It's not like you're, you're immature if you don't agree with me. It's no, you've been made perfect. So that should be your view in Christ Jesus. And now he says, I want you to live into that perfection through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Through the word and prayer and the, the church that Paul says, this community, that's how we live in to that perfection. We need to experience it. We need to take hold of it. And I think because Thanksgiving's coming up, I'm already thinking about pecan pie, which is my favorite pie. And maybe I cut a piece of pecan pie and I've, I take hold of it and I go sit down. But it's not till I take a bite of that pecan pie and taste of it <laughs> that I experience it, right? And, and so I was thinking about that living into what, what we've already attained. And Psalm 34, 8 says this, Taste and see what, that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. You ever thought about that? Taste and see that the Lord is good. It's when we taste of the fruit of the Spirit and the joy and the hope and the forgiveness and the peace that Paul's talking about, that's when we really experience the reality and begin to want more 
See, we want more of that to live into that. First Peter 2, 2 says, like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk so that you by it may grow into your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So I want to encourage you today on several things, and then we're going to wrap it up before we blow away here. Um, I want you to go back to Philippians 3 and meditate on these passages because they're so key, but press on. Keep fighting. Don't give up. Press on to win the, the race. Press on to win the prize and know that to do that, you've got to forget some things. And so I want to take just a moment before we close and just have you self-reflect. What do you need to forget to move forward? It might be different for us all, but, but I, want to, I really don't want you to turn your screen off or to leave this morning without forgetting something. Whether it's a failure or success, are there some things that are holding you back from taking hold of Christ Jesus? Could you take a moment and just think about that? And forget it. Say, God, help me forget it. And it's because failure and dwelling on failure will keep you from the future that God has planned for your life. Live into it, lean into it, and may the blood of Jesus that we're going to celebrate in just a moment perfect you once again this morning. And I pray you can live into that reality this week through the power of the Spirit. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today, Lord. Thank you for holding back the rain here um, that we could worship you. And Father, thank you for the power of your word, Lord. And I know there's some things that I need to forget in my life, Lord, to move forward, to press on towards the goal, to win that prize that you've given us already, already in Christ Jesus, Lord. So, Lord, if we're discouraged, help us to press on. If we're sad, help us to press on. If we're angry this morning, help us to press on. If we're disappointed with the world and, and leadership and what's happening, Lord, help us to press on. If we are trapped in sin, help us to press on this morning in Christ Jesus and through your power, win the race for which we have been called heavenward. May our eyes Look to heaven and may we taste of heaven through Christ Jesus while we are in this life, God. That's what you have for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.